There are a lot of videos out there that teach you how to move an object on the canvas in a straight line. The simplest way of moving an object would be to simply increment or decrement the X or Y coordinates of the object. This is a very primitive way of moving the object however, because it means that your object will be restricted to moving at a consistent speed in four directions, forwards, backwards, up and down, which are of course the directions that are constrained by the object's X and Y coordinates. The more advanced way that some other people use is to use trigonometry to send the object going in any direction that you want it to. All you need is a direction to send the object in and from that you can work out the x and y velocities through the cosine and sine of the angle respectively. You can then multiply these velocities by a set speed to send the object going in that specific direction. This is obviously the more favoured method for a lot of people because it means that the object is no longer constrained to moving in a direction that conforms to either its x or y axis. Whatever method you used however, both have one gaping admission, that is the ability to move the object on a curve instead of the object being moved in a straight line. Now there are many different reasons as to why you would want to do this. In this example here, we want to move the object around a corner and to do that we have to move it in a curve like so. However, if we could only move the object in a straight line, which is the only way that we could move it in the previous two methods, then it would be impossible to get the object to move around the corner without it colliding with the wall. That is why in this video I'll be introducing Bezier curves to you and how to move objects along one of these Bezier curves at a consistent speed in HTML Canvas. To demonstrate the concepts covered in this tutorial more clearly, I have created this little application where you can tweak the four different control points to make a Bezier curve that suits your liking. You can then press the play button to see the board travel along the curve that you had just created and you can configure the speed here. I posted a link to this application's code pen page if you want to play around with this application for yourself. You may also find this application beneficial in your own projects. That is because it can be hard to visualise what the final curve will look like when you are working with numbers only and have no way to visualise what the finished result will look like. So all you will be working with in your application is these numbers here which define the four control points of the Bezier curve. You won't actually know what the finished Bezier curve will look like which is displayed by this split line here, this guideline which the board travels in. So if you get stuck at any times you can use this application and be able to see the kind of Bezier curve that is created from using a specific combination of coordinates, which are these coordinates here. An interesting point to note is that you can actually make the object go in a kind of loop-de-loop. -loop. All you need to do is position the four control points into a kind of X shape, which can be shown here. And as you can see from this guideline, we already know which direction that the object is going to go in, and you can adjust it to your choosing, but basically it's the same. Again, if that was too fast for you, we can lower the speed, and as you can clearly see, the object or the bore is going in that loop-de-loop -loop direction, which is shown by this guideline here. But before we continue with the tutorial, what actually is a Bezier curve? Well, the curve is self-explanatory, we all know what one of those is. The Bezier part refers to the mathematical equation that creates the curve from a set of four coordinates. This differs from other ways to create a curve, such as a quadratic curve, which only uses three coordinates instead of two. Now the first and last coordinates define where the curve will start and end up at respectively. There's nothing curvature about that because obviously two coordinates, starting point and ending point, without these two coordinates here, that would just create a straight line. And that's the reason why these two coordinates here are what actually turns the line into a curve. And for that reason, these two coordinates here, they're called control points. These control points don't actually intersect with the Bezier curve however the starting and end points do. And once we have these four points, you will use them in a mathematical equation to work out their coefficients. There is no point memorising the calculation needed to work out these coefficients, as they are displayed on the screen now. All you need to know is that they use all four control points of the Bezier curve, and output values that we can use to increment our x and y positions by, to make it move along that Bezier curve. As for the incrementation process, that will not be as simple as adding these values to the x or y of the object. As you can see, we have four coefficient values. The following equation shows how we can use each of these four coefficient values 
to move the x and y coordinates of the object in order for it to move along the Bezier curve in each animation frame. So as you can see, each animation frame, the ball is moving at a, in a different position. It's not just jumping from here to there. As for the speed of the object, or the time it takes for the object to get from one end of the Bezier curve to the other, that will not be handled in the normal way, where you multiply the velocity by a set number to get the object moving with greater velocity, and therefore greater speed. Instead, we use what is known as the t-value, and we increment this value by a set number each time. When the t-value reaches 1, as it starts at 0, we will know that the animation is over and the object has reached the end of the Bezier curve. This is because the t-value represents the object's progress along the Bezier curve. So currently the animation is completed, meaning that the t-value will be set to 1. However, when the animation starts, meaning when it's up here, I'll just refresh so I can show you. So, so currently it's set to 0 because the animation hasn't started. And now it's over, it will be set to 1. And it's worth mentioning that the higher the value that the t value is incremented by, then the faster the animation will be. So say that we increment the t value by 0.1, for example, that will mean that it would only take 10 animation frames for the object to reach the end of the Bezier curve, because 0.1 multiplied by 10 is 1, which is always the finishing value of t. So that means that all we are doing with this speed gouge here is we are increasing the number at which we increment the t-value by on the higher settings and then decreasing that number on the lower settings. So I think on speed 1 it's set to be 0.01 which means the animation takes up 100 canvas frames. However, on speed 10 we are incrementing the t-value by just 0.1 which means that the animation only takes 10 canvas frames for it to be completed. And this is how we configure the rate at which the board travels along the Bezier curve. And now it's time to move on with the main part of this tutorial. To not waste time, I have already set up the basic markup and styling that I will be using in this project. So this is the markup here, and this is the styling, and this is the finished result here. As you can see, it's not too dissimilar to my application here. Just about, we haven't done anything on the canvas yet, and there's also no buttons or anything. Now it's also worth mentioning that the canvas dimensions are 600 by 600 pixels, making it a square. Now your canvas dimensions may be different to that, and because of that, your coordinates may look a bit different on your canvas to what they look like on mine, and you may want to alter the coordinates that you use because of that, but it shouldn't be too much of a difference. I'm just mentioning it now, just in case you encounter any errors, if you do decide to follow along with this tutorial. As for the scripting, we will begin that now. And we will start by doing the first thing that we should do in any JavaScript file that interacts with the canvas. That is extracting the context from the canvas so we can use the context to draw graphics onto the canvas. Next, we will create the function that will be repeatedly evoked on each frame of the canvas, meaning that everything that changes on each canvas frame to facilitate animation needs to be associated with this core function. We will then call this animate function once on document load, and from that it will be called on each new animation frame thanks to this request animation frame function. From then onwards it will be called on each subsequent canvas frame thanks to this request animation frame method here. Now to actually get the canvas to display new graphics on each canvas frame, hence animation, we will need to wipe out the contents of the previous canvas frame by clearing the entire width and height of the canvas before we draw new graphics onto the canvas for each frame, which will be done below this code here. So the animation does not begin on document load, meaning that we won't have enough time to see it. I've created this boolean here, and it will only be set to true when the user clicks on the canvas, which is the purpose of this event listener here. Now obviously we haven't actually rendered anything to our canvas, it's still blank. And to get rid of that blank canvas, we are going to render our board to the canvas. But before we actually draw anything to the canvas, we will need to create a basic object to hold values that we will use to draw the board to the canvas. Notice that we have included this aforementioned t-value, which we spoke about beforehand. It starts at 0 and it will finish at 1. And at the moment, we will increment it by the speed field, which at the moment is set to 0.1. So this means that our current animation will be quite fast 
because remember as I said before the t-value when it's set to 1 that means that the ball has finished traveling along the Bezier curve and the animation's complete and because it's incremented by 0.1 that means that it would only take 10 canvas frames for t to reach 1. That means that the animation will only consist of 10 animation frames because it only takes 10 increments of the t value by 0.1 to get t to be 1. We will then create a function that uses the values stored in the board object to actually render the board to the canvas. Obviously the board won't be drawn to the canvas unless we call this function on every canvas frame. But since all this function does is render a static unmoving board, we will only call the function when the user has not clicked on the canvas to indicate that they want the animation to start. And we know that they've done this when this boolean is equal to true. So now if we go back to our canvas, and as you can see, the board has been rendered to the canvas, and then when we click, it disappears. Obviously, we want the board to be moving along a busier curve, not just staying in one place. So the first step in getting the board to move along a busier curve would be to define the four points that are intrinsic to the creation of any Bezier curve. So as you can see, we've created them as objects in an array. The array is there so we can separate different curves out from each other. Now the starting coordinate shares the same values as the board's x and y values as you can see. This is because we do not want the board to suddenly jump to another location when the animation starts. So we want that transition from idle to animation states to be smooth. As for where these values have come from, they match, as you can see, they match this busier curve that is loaded up on default on my application that I made here. And you can tell as much by looking at the coordinate values below the points themselves, so these numbers here. Now it's all well and good creating the points, but obviously we want the board to move along the points. So we will create this function that will handle the board's movement along the busier curve, and we will want it to be called when the user has clicked on the canvas to indicate that they want the animation to start. The first thing that we will do in this function is destruct the different coordinates from the points array. We will need access to the individual objects because they will be used frequently throughout the rest of this function. We will then use these points that we just destructured from the points array to calculate the coefficients. Now if you're confused by the following code here, then refer back to the coefficient equation that is currently being displayed on the screen. So basically all I am doing is passing my now defined coordinates into the equation so we can calculate the relevant coefficients to our points of the busier curve. We will then extract the t value from the ball object we do that now because we are about to increment the t-value by the value of speed. Therefore, we are getting access to the t-value before it has become incremented. This unincremented t-value is what we will be using in our equation to work out the new x and y coordinates of the ball. So as previously mentioned, we will now increment the value of t by the value of speed to facilitate the ball's progression along the busier curve. We will then use the other equation that is currently being displayed on the screen to get the new x and y coordinates of the ball. Notice how t is being incorporated into this equation. t is what allows the ball to progress along the Bezier curve, and the further t's value is to 1, the closer the ball will be to the end of the Bezier curve. Because remember, 1 is the finishing value of t no matter how much t is incremented by. And because of this, we will then check to see if the value of t is greater than 1. This could occur if the animation has reached its end and the value of t is 1 because of it. But even if t has reached its 1 value, this function is still going to be called every frame of the canvas, even though the animation is now complete. And because it's still being called, the value of t is still being incremented by speed. And in this situation, we will need to make sure that t cannot be incremented past the value of 1 so that the ball stays positioned at the end of the curve and does not go past it because the animation is now complete. And this works because the t that we actually use in the equation is not this incremented value here, it's this one that we extract before the incrementation process. So that's how the ball stays put once the animation is over. Finally, we will set the ball's x and y coordinates to match its new coordinates that we have just calculated. 
Then we will call the draw ball function so that the board's new position can actually be drawn onto the canvas. So now if you go back to our application, we refresh just in case, and then we click. As you can see, we could see the board travel in the arc, and then once that animation's over, even though this function here that moves the board is still being called and not the draw ball static representation of the board, it's still staying put because of this if statement here. And again, like I said before, if you want to slow our animation, then we will decrease the value of speed. So it's currently 0.01. So now we refresh, or oh, it's already refreshed. We click, as you can see, it goes a lot slower because it's being incremented by a lower value. And there's currently 100 frames until the curve of the ball gets completed because it takes 100 iterations and 0.01 to reach the value of one, which is always the finishing value of T. One final thing that is worth mentioning, because my object of choice was a bore, which was drawn to the canvas using the arc method, we needn't have made any adjustments to the final XT and XY values, which we assign to the bore's X and Y values here. And the reason why we didn't need to do that is because these X and Y values refers to the bore's center, which is the default behavior of Canvas when we use the arc method to draw any graphics to the screen. However, if we are trying to move a different object on a Bezier curve, one that was drawn not with the arc method, but it was drawn as an image or as a rectangle, for example, then we would need to make changes to this code here, this final code at the bottom, because the object's X and Y values do not refer to their center, Instead, they refer to the top left corner of the object. As such, you will need to subtract half of either the width or height of the object from the XT and XY values, respectively. This is to adjust their values that they are associated with the control point of the object and not the sensor of it. And the code to do that is shown on the screen now. Now, all it is doing is adjusting the calculated XT and YT values so that they can be applied to the X and Y values of the object which are meant to control the top left corner and not the center because it would treat the top left corner of the object as the object's center which is obviously not what we want we want the top left corner to be treated as the top left corner and so it should only take in values that are relevant to aligning its top left corner and that's all there is for this tutorial i hope that you benefited from it if you have any questions then please don't hesitate to post them down in the comments box below and i'll be sure to answer them to the best of my ability and please like and subscribe because you would be doing me a huge favour if you did that. And of course, peace out guys.